tracing uh, is something I created um, uh, uh, about, let me just make sure we're all recording. Yes, uh, created about three years ago or so. Uh, Luke joined the project and has helped me a lot in both testing it and making it better. Uh, added some really exciting features that he's gonna talk about uh, here toward the end of the talk today. Um, and uh, you know, if, uh, if any of you have any questions as I'm giving the talk, uh, like I say, put, put them in chat or um, feel free to interrupt if, they're, if you're comfortable doing that. And it's a you know, relatively quick question, of course. Uh, and so I'll begin. So I think of LKT as kind of an erector set for student models. Uh, I think of erector sets as the uh, original sort of STEM toy. You see an actual picture here of, of one. I think they were, you know, invented in the 30s, 40s, or 50s. I'm not, I, I haven't done all the research on these, uh, but I actually had one uh, uh, of the originals that was kind of beat up, and then I had all the, few of the newer ones, and, uh, and, and so that, I think I'm kind of transferring some of my experiences with these, you know, multi-component toolkits uh, to what uh, has been built here with LKT. Uh, so student modeling then, uh, what we're going to be talking about today differs from cognitive modeling. Uh, I know people will come from different traditions. Uh, and so a student modeling is focused on the prediction of outcomes. Uh, and typically we're more interested in the model fit and how well we can do the prediction and whether that prediction generalizes than we are any theory of, of learning necessarily. I mean, a theory of learning, I think, really contributes to our ability to do student modeling. Uh, however, uh, 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 with cognitive modeling, you have more attention to the actual cognitive processes, you know, how, how many milliseconds it takes to do the encoding, then how many milliseconds they're, they're doing some sort of cognitive process and so forth. Less attention to the fit, more attention to the pattern of the effects and the mechanism uh, of the explanation. So just to point you to some resources here as we're getting going. Uh, there's both the CRAN page uh, and the GitHub page. Uh, and uh, um, actually, let me sh make sure I'm sharing the right thing here because I may only be sharing the slides. Okay, I, I guess I'm sharing the whole monitor now. And so you should see me showing the CRAN page. Uh, and the reason why it's relevant, of course, is if you go here, uh, let me make it just a little bigger. You can see that it has links for the reference manual, uh, the vignettes, talking about basic operations and the examples. We're gonna be going through those examples later today uh, and you'll have a chance to ask questions about any of those. Uh, but you know, this resource is always here for you. Also too, there's the GitHub page. If you would ever wanna you know, conveniently look at the actual R code, you could go to the GitHub page and like look at the LKT functions. Uh, and you know, see about some particular feature you might want to use, and you know, because maybe you're writing a paper on it, and you need to know the mathematical details to explain it in the paper. Of course, I'm ha happy to I'll help interpret the code if you need to go in that deep ever. Uh, so send me an email and tell me what you're working on. So back to the slides, though. Uh, we can also see if you go into that PDF for the manual there that uh, it actually describes the data sets that are included in the package. And one of those is the large, large raw sample. Uh, and this is a data set from the Memphis Data Shop. Uh, the actually, the examples page, I noticed a mistake in it. It says that you have to get the data. Uh, in version 1.2, you don't have to get the data anymore. It's built into the package. And so we'll be able to run these examples without doing any downloads uh, or, or, or anything like that uh, straight from the get-go. Uh, and so it may be easy for some of you who are experienced with R to actually follow along during that part of the, the uh, uh, tutorial and seminar here today. Uh, so, you know, when talking about uh, student models, often we start talking about Bayesian knowledge tracing uh, because it's been around so long. Uh, there's the uh, well-known Corbett and Anderson paper uh, that, uh, you know, talks about uh, how it's used. And of course, the history of Bayesian knowledge tracing goes back to the 60s uh, uh, with, uh, uh, you know, a number of different people who, who got it going and then it got formalized uh, kind of in this Corbett and Anderson paper, and it's been used in that form uh, in the Carnegie Learning Cognitive Tutors 
uh, in, in many other applications and many papers uh, in that specific form. Uh, you know, I, I, basically knowledge tracing has its advantages. It's rather simple to think about, uh, you know, because it only has these four parameters, uh, the initial learning, the learning rate, the chance that the student gets a guess right, and the chance they have a slip. Uh, but it's, it's uh, not uh, particularly easy to use in a lot of ways uh, because it, it isn't something simple like regression like we're going to be talking about today. Uh, and it, it's not particularly accurate because with only four parameters, there's a lot of sort of learning effects that it doesn't capture. Uh, for instance, forgetting, uh, which turn out to be very important in a lot of learning paradigms. Uh, and they're very difficult to build into Bayesian knowledge tracing because of its structure. Uh, and so uh, early on, I decided to kind of adopt a more logistic regression sort of uh, formalization. Uh, and th this is the earliest uh, type of logistic regression used like this uh, is essentially the additive factors model. Uh, and it, it's kind of uh, useful to start with this additive factors model because it's the obvious transition uh, between uh, uh, item response theory and, and models of student learning uh, when you're talking about regression. Uh, and so the, the additive factors model still has the important parameters describing the difficulty of the items uh, and the proficiency of the student uh, that IRT does, but it adds just one simple additional term. It adds a linear slope, uh, which tracks the number of prior opportunities uh, that the student has uh, been uh, learning that uh, a particular knowledge component. Uh, and so, uh, uh, I believe, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, the, the, the paper that's de, uh, described in the uh, package description, the LKT paper we've uh, uh, published in the Transactions on Learning Technology, the IEEE Transactions on Learning Technologies, describes all this history that I'm talking about if you want to go into more detail. Uh, and so, um, uh, but this model is, is relatively simple. It's, it's just your regression with a predictor for. Uh, the student, a predictor for the uh, uh, item, and, and a predictor uh, for the number of prior opportunities for that. Uh, um, well, I shouldn't say item because it's actually knowledge component. And this is something I didn't include in my slides, but I realize some people aren't familiar with based on my experience at a recent conference, uh, which is that uh, in the uh, tradition that we're talking about here, uh, both Bayesian knowledge tracing and logistic models, and also in many ways the, the new uh, deep learning models, uh, is that we're talking about knowledge components. And knowledge components can be any skill or proficiency, anything one learns. Uh, and so the, a, a domain of content, say like biology, is split up into a number of knowledge components. And this is just the rough theory that we use uh, in order to map uh, the particular items to uh, these knowledge components, so we can look at performance for these these uh, theoretical constructs. You know, uh, knowledge of a particular thing separately from the individual items that might quiz or or help learning for that particular thing. Uh, and so we could even consider items as their own knowledge components, of course. Uh, and that's why sometimes I'll slip in my terminology and I'll say items uh, when I mean knowledge components, because oftentimes I look at a research uh, and, and models where the items are the knowledge components, and I'm looking at the repetitions of the items. Uh, uh, other times I'm looking at the actual knowledge components where there's multiple items grouped together, uh, and, and you know, they're either uh, given randomly when the knowledge component is sampled according to the order built in the learning system. Uh, but this gets into a lot of different side issues as well. So feel free to, uh, to hit us with questions there in the chat. Uh, even if they're just questions about the background, uh, I, I'm a firm believer in no stupid questions. Uh, and so, uh, so yeah. So then, uh, you know, when I started working on this, the additive factors model was already kind of built. Uh, it, it, like I say, its history is described in uh, uh, the paper cited uh, along with the package uh, description in that IEEE paper. Uh, and, and so, uh, I noticed one thing that I was not seeing that, that uh, you know, was really important in the cognitive psychology uh, literature, uh, I, you know, especially in the early 2000s, but even before then, uh, was the difference between successes and failures. Uh, and so there's a lot of um, 
difference uh, between a student getting a success and a failure. And if we slip back there for a second to the, uh, I'm sorry, that was forward, uh, back to the additive factors model, we're looking at all the prior opportunities and we're treating all the prior opportunities as providing the same information. And of course, if a prior opportunity is success, it provides different, different information than if a prior opportunity is a failure. And so that was all that the PFA model did. Uh, it was this simple, simple adaptation in logistic regression where it was responsive to the successes and failures for the knowledge component. Uh, again, we're looking at the, the split into these, these knowledge components. Uh, and, and so this PFA model now cited more than 460 times uh, fulfilled this basic demand for adaptive logistic regression. And that's the only reason why it's been cited. Uh, it, it's not a particularly complicated idea. Uh, I just split the additive factors opportunities into the opportunities for successes and the opportunities for failures. Uh, it's, it has the um, uh, uh, fixed student and KC parameters, uh, just like the additive factors map model. Uh, and it has this ad dynamic adaptive counts of the knowledge component. Uh, on top of those fixed starting places for the student aptitude and the, and the knowledge component uh, difficulty. And so then here we finally get to a little bit of the details of LQ, or not finally, I guess it's, it hasn't been that long yet. Uh, we get to some of the details of LKT. Uh, and so here we have the equation uh, from uh, one of the papers I've written talking about PFA. This is actually the paper uh, with uh, Yudelson um, uh, Yellowson, Pavlik, uh, and uh, I can't remember our third author, uh, but that was the one um, where we're looking at, uh, uh, it's called the black art, uh, student modeling is a black art. And the reason why student modeling is kind of a black art is because there's so many options and it's so difficult to compare them. Uh, and there's you know a lot of side effects of, of the choices we make. Uh, and so it's, it's by, by no means uh, is it well understood exactly how we should do a lot of these things. Uh, and I was getting at that in the title of that 2011 paper. Uh, and so on the right, then we can see the formal notation for PFA where the theta indicates the student parameter uh, and the beta indicates the item difficulty. Uh, the uh, gamma uh, is the parameter that is the uh, multiplied the coefficient, coefficient that's multiplied by the count of successes for the KC. Uh, and the rho is the failures for the, for the KC. Uh, as you might imagine, the I is actually counting the students and the J is counting the KCs. Uh, and so you can see the beta J means the difficulty of the KC. The gamma J means the effect of successes for that KC. The SIJ means the count of successes for that student for that KC uh, and so forth. And so there's this formal notation we can use. Uh, and, and we also might be wondering about the summation sign. The summation sign uh, over all of the possible J's indicates the fact that the full PFA model implies that you could actually have multiple KC's involved in each performance. Uh, and so you would then have the difficulties of all of the KC's, the, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the effect of the successes for all of the KC's as separate terms, separately summed in there. Typically, however, this isn't a uh, used, uh, we, we, don't, we don't often use these models. And there's actually problems if you're really following the deep uh, implications of what I'm saying, you would realize that what, what, I, what I was saying about multi-skill models isn't quite gonna work in some cases here for, for PFA. Uh, and, and, and in fact, in a lot of the work we see for learner models, we don't use multi-skill models. It's a one uh, area that you know, is, is ripe for future research is, is how we can create and, and employ multi-skill models in this work. Uh, I have some examples to touch on that a little bit as well later on. Uh, and so on the left then we can see how this uh, equation then would be coded in LKT uh, and uh, would be run over a data set uh, without having to do any additional, uh, well, there's, there's some pre data preparation uh, but there's no, no uh, special data preparation actually for this particular one, uh, uh, more just regular data cleaning. And I'll talk a little bit about that when we deal with the larger, large raw sample uh, in the examples. 
Uh, but say the data has, has you know, been cleaned out, all of the non-success and failure examples have been cleaned out, for instance. So it's just the, the data for the performance, for the KCs, for the students. Uh, and it, it's sorted first. Uh, uh, and so this is just saying, oh, uh, there I did it again. I'm going back. Uh, I, this is just saying first that the uh, intercept, uh, we're going to have a global intercept indicating the overall difficulty. Uh, actually, as I see it here, uh, that intercept is redundant, uh, and that's a slip on my part. We wouldn't need an intercept here because you can see later on uh, that we're requesting a student intercept for each KC. And so the components indicate uh, the, 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 the level at which the feature is run. Uh, and the features indicate what we do uh, for that uh, uh, level of the data. Uh, and so the, it, to, to learn this, it really helps to map a couple to an equation. Uh, and that's what this slide is for, is to help us do that mapping. So first let's in, ignore the global intercept, which is not in uh, the equation. Uh, sorry, I didn't remember to pull that out. Uh, but you can see the components then start with the uh, student ID, and that's our theta. And you can see how theta is subscripted with an I. Uh, and then I have KC default, KC default, KC default listed three times. That's because uh, we're, we're only going to use this one column for our knowledge components uh, that lists uh, a, a single knowledge component uh, for each performance. Uh, and of course, however, we're going to use that for in three different cases. The first KC default is going to apply to the, the intercept feature down here, uh, the second intercept feature. The second KC default is going to be the line suck dollar sign. And the third KC default is going to be the line fail dollar sign. I'll explain what the dollar sign means in just a second. Uh, and so, so then what we're saying then is that for the students, we want an intercept. For the KCs, we want an intercept. For the KCs, we want to look at the linear effect of prior successes. And for the KCs, we want to look at the linear effect of prior failures. Uh, and when we look at something at the KC level, it's always assumed that we're going to compute it only for the KCs within that student. In other words, the IJ is assumed. Uh, we would never count the prior successes for a different student and credit it to you know, another guy. Uh, and so. So this might be a good place to, to just let my uh, take a sip of water and see if there's any questions. Okay, I'll continue. Okay, uh, so we're, not actually, we're not actually comparing LKT uh, with PFA. Hey, Phil, uh, the uh, question came up in the chat. Um, why are we comparing yes, LKT? I was answering it. Oh, okay. Apparently I have my screen arranged better than I expected. Uh, usually I have difficulty following the chat, uh, but for some reason I've been able to get the gallery and the chat on, the, on my bottom screen uh, and uh, I'm, I'm working pretty smooth here. That's a great question. And it, it, it involves me not giving enough prior information. We're actually looking at PFA done within LKT. Uh, and I didn't point out that LKT is not a model in of itself, right? It's a framework for building models. It's like an erector set. And with that erector set, we can build a PFA. Uh, and that's what I'm showing us how to do here because the PFA has been cited so many times, a lot of people can connect with it. Um, uh, and so is that uh, uh, answering your question, Lakshmi? Excellent. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I'm getting people lost with these details because I, I'm moving too fast on things. I'm using my expert blind spot. Uh, uh, one of uh, Ken Katinger's favorite things to talk about also is, is how we have all these expert blind spots when we try to explain these things to other people. Yeah, maybe a good thing to say just overall is, um, or maybe you said this before, but it's worth reiterating that the point of LKT is to kind of move away from like these like single models that we talk about as if they're independent things and more towards there's these specific like particular features we want to use and compare right different variants and that's what lkt is that's what this package is about is about being able to build like an arbitrarily large family of different models for different situations and compare them 
Yeah, and Luke was foreshadowing my, my next slide here, which I, I slipped to, uh, which shows some examples of other models that were in sometimes based on PFA, sometimes not based on PFA, PFA uh, sometimes uh, based on AFM, sometimes based on uh, uh, you know, different psychological theories, like in the case of PPE. But all of these models then, including PFA, can be built with LKT. Uh, and so if you choose to use LKT, you're making a some, somewhat of a commitment to looking at logistic regression, of course, but you're not making a commitment to look at any sort of logistic regression or the, the models that I've created in the past. Uh, you're, you're, you're basically kind of opening yourself up to be able to construct uh, whatever you might need. Uh, PFA decay uh, was an early example of, of this kind of proliferation uh, in what I call the march of the variance. Uh, and so in this one, uh, the successes and failures are recency weighted. Uh, and so you don't just count them, you actually weight them more if they happen more recently. And of course that works better. Uh, RPFA, uh, this is, uses a proportion of prior correct, rather actually a uh, percentage of, of prior correct for the KC rather than uh, uh, you know, six, the counts. Uh, and, and so this one uh, also though is recency weighted and it turns out to work a little bit better than the PFA decay in some of their tests. Uh, these all correspond with a paper and these papers are cited in that one paper that I referenced, the IEEE paper that in the package documentation. Uh, and, and so I, AFM, uh, this, this one adds a learning slope for each person. Uh, PFA difficulty, this uh, has difficulty weighted success and failure. In other words, the prior difficulty at the time of the success and the failure uh, is what controls how much is learned. Uh, hey, Phil, so yeah. I got a question in the chat here. Um, oh, great. Be able to see them or can we read it to you? So uh, uh, this, it does support multi-skills. The question is not uh, uh, whether um, it supports them, but whether it works very well. Um, and so, you know, you have to think about how you're combining things uh, and whether you can just combine things additively. Um, and so, um, uh, you know, for instance, if you have two, two skill columns, and I actually have an example that has two skill columns later on, um, uh, where you know each of the particular performances has two possible skills, can you just add them? Okay, and, and so uh, in regression, you know, uh, we we have a a, a linear equation uh, of of added additive terms, uh, and uh, is it is it is it going to produce a good pr prediction uh, if we add them, particularly if we're also using those values independently, uh, and and to to kind of uh, to highlight that. If I go back to this, where was it? Um, yeah, uh, in, in this example, uh, if we think about how the beta J is being used, uh, in other words, it's a difficulty value for each of the uh, KCs. Uh, it doesn't necessarily make sense to add the difficulties of the KCs. Uh, and so uh, if, 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 if you have two easy KCs uh, and, and, and they have, um, and you add their difficulties, it might become more difficult. Uh, and, uh, and so um, where if, if you have uh, two difficult KCs, uh, it could become more easy. And, and so it, it, it really depends upon whether your parameters are above or below a zero when you add them actually as to what happens here uh, with these KC difficulty parameters. And you can't really sum them then. Uh, I think it works better, tending, it tends to work better when you sum skills, uh, 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 but uh, you still have this problem uh, uh, that you, know, there's, um, you don't necessarily wanna combine them additively. Uh, and as you can see, this equation uses addition. And so it means the combination of the successes for one of the KCs plus the effects of the successes for the other KCs. Uh, but maybe uh, th those two KCs are, 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 are um, you know, uh, uh, kind of multicollinear. In other words, they share variance. And so if you get high with one, it doesn't really matter if you're high with the other one. Uh, and so these sort of relationships uh, are difficult to, to capture and understand. And this, in fact, could be a, a key advantage of things like deep knowledge tracing, 
uh, as they may more naturally handle these relationships. However, maybe not because many, there's been a couple recent papers that have suggested that logistic regression models, when they include uh, uh, you know, a good sample of the possible predictors often do as well as deep knowledge tracing. Uh, so perhaps these uh, you know, multi-skill sort of uh, representations either aren't important uh, or they don't make much of a difference or maybe that's the same thing. Hopefully that wasn't too long-winded, but there's a really a lot to unpack there and there's already been uh, somewhat uh, good a section of uh, papers uh, you know, written about this issue. There's one um, about it that I was published on that Katinger led. Um, uh, can, you, can you find the one, uh, Luke, about uh, uh, thrashing uh, and conjunctive knowledge uh, tracing that sure. Katinger was the first author on and drop it in there for Camille? Yeah, I'm also adding in the one that compared to deep knowledge tracing. Cool, thanks. So feel free to ask follow-ups. Yep. Yeah, okay, great. I'm glad it helps. Okay, that was, then, your, so, that was your paper about that was your paper about uh, the knowledge thrashing you're talking about, right? Yeah, however, Katie was first author. That's what I was saying. Right. Uh, and so um, so then we have this march of the variants that has occurred, you know, since AFM was introduced, because in fact PFA was one of these variants in my mind. Uh, uh, and so without a master program, each method has been hand tooled. Uh, and this is inconvenient for people who want to replicate things. This is inconvenient for each person who wants to build a model in this style. Uh, it's a pain in the arse to redo for each data set. Uh, researcher time is valuable. Uh, uh, now it will be easy for you to use many variants and discover what model models your data best. Uh, you know, and of course, if you prefer deep knowledge tracing, it's also a nice way to make a comparison model. Uh, if you want to compare your deep knowledge tracing model versus logistic knowledge tracing, uh, you know you could you could easily code up something like the best uh, best LR, uh, uh, you know, which was done by uh, uh, I think the paper that uh, that Luke was going to uh, suggest yeah. here. I'm also making um I'm making a Jupyter notebook that loads up LKT, builds some models, but and compares to an approach that uses like multi layer perceptron networks, things like that, um, with the LKT features. So that's going to be fair to me. would like to send to the list after? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So uh, greater flexibility is gained in LKT. You can match any component, the student, the KC, the item. You can work simultaneously with KCs and items. Uh, with any feature, uh, line AFM, that's the one I talked about uh, that does the FM model. Uh, we, didn't, uh, we didn't see that one in the LKT code. We saw the, the line suck and the line fail. Uh, it can be a static, dynamic, or adaptive. Um, uh, the, the differences between these are a static one would not change for each knowledge component. A dynamic one would change, but wouldn't be based on prior performance, whereas an adaptive one changes based on performance. Let's see, we have a, con a question in here. Let me see if I, uh, in the chat. How does the uh, model account for the skewness and the beta value? Uh, asking this, because it could be very well be the case that higher knowledge students go through the material at a quicker pace than lower knowledge students. Well, I think this, this question, you know, is, it has to do with the, uh, complexity of the model, right? Uh, and that I, I can see one adding terms to capture here. I'm, I'm an answering Andrew's question in chat. Uh, I can see one adding terms to, uh, to deal with these complexities in, in high knowledge students, like having an interaction between their learning rate uh, and their, their, their performance. Uh, uh, and so that if they had a higher performance, then it would predict a higher learning rate uh, as, a, as a course in the model. We, we don't see this in the literature right now, but it's, it's exactly the sort of reason why I, I you know, uh, have been so interested in <clears throat> moving forward with LKT, because unless you can build the simple bones of the model first easily, you can't ask more complicated questions like this, Andrew. Um, and so thanks for the question. And, and maybe we can try to flesh it out a little bit later when we're looking at some of the examples. 
So, uh, so it, it, it can be applied per level of component or overall. Uh, more, re more recently, I've added interactions. Uh, we're happy to add your feature to the package if it makes sense or if it's part of a publication. Uh, and so, uh, in other words, it, it doesn't need to be published if I like it. <laughs> Uh, but if it's published, I'll probably want to put it in there uh, if, if you can help me with the code regardless, uh, because other people want to compare. Uh, and I won't make, I won't ask questions too, because your reviewers have already checked to make sure it's useful um, uh, if it's published and I'll be very motivated to, to get it in, in the system. Uh, if you actually send the code for the feature, it may be a quick addition, uh, even, even better if you add it using GitHub. And so you could actually go in if you've had problems with LKT, LKT or if you want to suggest additions, you could go into the, um, uh, the GitHub repository and post those as issues. Uh, so LKT then is built on super fast R packages. Uh, it's not based on the built-in logistic regression. Uh, that causes some limitations. Uh, uh, however, we're overcoming those limitations and, and, and plan to overcome uh, remaining limitations. Um, uh, one of the limitations would be that uh, we can't do mixed effect regression, uh, though we're looking at a, a, a package called Julia that uh, might allow that. Uh, because or this language, language, rather. What's that? A language, rather. Oh, the language that can be called from R using, probably using an R package? Yeah, called Julia is the R package. <laughs> okay, very good. Uh, yeah, I haven't uh, looked into it yet. Uh, uh, Luke was the one who, who uh, brought it to my attention. And lib, that's because LibLinear has this disadvantage of not running uh, the, the, the random effects. Uh, and so right now, it, uh, the system LKT is rather slow for random effects because it just uses the built-in R random effects. Uh, and so, uh, so you'll see that limitation. However, one thing that is really good is if you're willing to uh, deal with uh, you know, standard logistic regression and fixed effects, which is what many of the papers have used, in fact, a lot of the uh, research publications have not used random effects, and so it's by no means a requirement to, to get a publication. Uh, uh, but the, this disadvantage has allowed us to handle very large data sets, and so I've done models with greater than 10,000 coefficients uh, and 2 million rows of data uh, you know, in real time on my home computer. Uh, and so uh, and, and also, too, I'd like to point out that, you know, it seems like people are oftentimes looking at uh, larger data sets without necessarily having a good reason. Uh, if oftentimes, if you can't find it, uh, you know, an effect in a smaller data set with 100,000 or 200,000 observations, it might mean that it's not large enough to be practically useful. Uh, and so uh, it depends on, you know, what, what sort of... Uh, uh, applications and, and, and where you're headed with your results. Uh, but that's another thing to, to keep track of uh, if you're you know, uh, thinking about uh, doing this sort of modeling regularly. Of course, it also depends a lot on the design of the data. If you have a well-designed sort of experimental uh, comparison, uh, this is even more true that you'll need fewer subjects. Whereas if you're doing kind of raw uh, you know, uh, data mining on uh, just an adaptive learning system that has no comparison, uh, then larger data may be more useful. So uh, this mentions the, uh, the one of the sample data sets, sample LKT. Uh, so I didn't uh, update this slide yet. Uh, we also have the large uh, raw uh, sample that I'm gonna be working with today in the examples. Uh, and, and so that's, uh, uh, you know, this, this one is ready to use without uh, doing any uh, post-processing. The larger one, part of the reason why I wanted to put it in raw was to get an exa uh, give an example of how to clean up a data set, uh, because oftentimes that's a, you know, a real starting block for people who are trying to get into learner modeling, uh, is getting the data set properly cleaned up first. So then this is kind of a, you know, a steps uh, you, if to use LKT, you get the data, make sure the format is correct. Consider the components given the data, you know, um, which KC to use, uh, uh, whether there's any other predictors, uh, you know, like perhaps you have different sessions uh, or different item types uh, that's, uh, you know, different sort of variable than your KC. Um, 
but consider the learning paradigm to detect the features. Uh, you know, this is going to help you choose what features. Uh, that's what I mean by detect the features to, to, to choose the features. Uh, for instance, if you have a memorization paradigm, you might be thinking about some things that have to do with recency or spacing effects. Whereas if you're uh, doing a problem solving paradigm, uh, you might be working with something closer to PFA uh, because you're not observing forgetting in the case Cs, you're only observing uh, you know, uh, this effect of successes and failures. Uh, so that you also then you consider the parameterization, the dollar sign operator coefficient for every level of feature. Uh, and what that means is if you add the dollar sign, I showed this earlier uh, with the, the line suck and the line fail with the example for PFA, it simply means that we're going to have a coefficient for every different KC for, for the, the, the slope, uh, how fast it's learned for every uh, individual knowledge component. If you don't include the dollar sign, it just simplifies the model and assumes that everything is learned at the same rate. Uh, and so this is used uh, whenever you're using the, uh, the knowledge components, uh, whenever you want to uh, have that larger parameterization. Um, uh, intercept is automatically at every level of whatever component you insert. Uh, <coughs> Uh, and so uh, the, the, um, uh, uh, you don't use a dollar sign with intercept is all that means. Uh, it, it's gonna, uh, you, you don't, when you put intercept in there, uh, it's gonna be for, um, uh, uh, in each level is gonna have a separate one. Uh, other features can be fit with one coefficient uh, for all levels. Um, that's just a note. Uh, uh, and then another question is, is do you need nonlinear parameters? And so we'll, we'll see some examples of nonlinear parameters. Some of these features, uh, like some of the memory ones, some of the recency ones, are based on the time since the prior uh, um, uh, encounter. Uh, it, it, so often in, in our learner modeling and these data sets, we're only looking at the number of events since the prior encounter. Uh, we're assuming the time steps are equal, in other words, uh, whereas um, some of the features in LKT allow us to move past that. Uh, but that's going to mean that we're introducing a nonlinear parameter, uh, you know, to, to, to scale the effect of time. Uh, and, and that needs to be fit outside of logistic regression. Uh, and and uh, there's a method, and I'll show how it works and explain it briefly. It's not used in, in many of the models. And so it's kind of a side point, um, uh, but it is this additional capability. Okay. So uh, all paradigms have individual. So this this now, now I'm talking about uh, how to con continuing on with how do we use LKT. All paradigms have individual differences, and the first thing we might determine uh, is whether we think we have individual differences. Uh, and so the, the two biggest individual differences are for individual students and items. Uh, and here I'm referring to uh, KCs, uh, and I probably should edit this slide. Uh, but we could be talking about KCs or items, because in fact, as I pointed out earlier, uh, uh, an item can be considered a KC at the lowest level. Um, and so uh, oftentimes we'll fit fixed intercepts, but we can also fit uh, you know, an adaptive tracing uh, for these uh, student or item variability. Uh, in other words, we can look at a function of the outcomes uh, for that particular component, whether it's student or KC. And so we can say, you know, uh, we can have a predictor that says the, uh, the successes uh, divided by the, the, the total uh, correct or total opportunities, in other words, the prior percent correct, uh, is, is a predictor of the per current percent correct. Uh, and so that would, of course, be very different than using a fixed value uh, for all values of the student. If we use the prior percent correct as a predictor, uh, that's going to kind of trace their prior learning uh, and allow us to predict the intercept uh, when we fit a coefficient to it in the regression. Uh, and so we'll see some examples of this later. Uh, uh, it's, uh, this second part of this is a little bit novel, uh, but it is thoroughly demonstrated in that IEEE paper that I mentioned earlier. Uh, then we can think about, you know, when we're building our model trade-offs, uh, PFA terms, counts of successes and failures, tend to capture both individual difference uh, 
uh, and learning together. Uh, in other words, uh, they, they, they capture um, uh, whether you know, people are, are learning because they're both gonna increase if people are learning. But on the other hand, uh, they also capture whether or not people have prior knowledge, whether people are, are you know, proficient at the task when they come into it already. Uh, and, and so uh, the, they have a lot of uh, multicollinearity. Uh, and so when you have uh, terms for success and failures in the, in the model, it becomes difficult to understand the more you use. Uh, and so, um, in other words, the parameters no longer identify specific effects. Uh, and if we just look at one predictor, uh, think about this in terms of the prior successes for a knowledge component. We can see that the prior successes for a knowledge component uh, is, is an indicator of learning, but it's an also an indicator of whether they knew it before. Uh, and so, uh, so you know, uh, when you're interpreting the parameter, it's hard to know which, uh, how much is, is due to the learning and how much is due to the fact that they, if they get it right, they might've already known it. Uh, similarly with a failure, uh, if they get it wrong, uh, they're probably learning something because they get feedback in most of these paradigms. But at the same time, they probably didn't know it before. And so maybe they don't learn it with the feedback. Uh, and so the, you know, one conflict here is that sometimes you'll even get negative uh, parameters for failures. And how do we interpret those? Uh, and if you want to get into some of the depth of this trade-off, you could go back to that paper I wrote with Yudelson in 2011, talking about how this is a black art. Uh, one way is to avoid having too much adaptation, uh, because when you have more terms dealing with the, 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 this uh, sort of flexibility uh, and responsiveness to prior learning, you also have more opportunities to overfit uh, and to uh, you know, fall into issues with multicollinearity. Uh, and and um, uh, you know, uh, this, this talk about the random effect models here, oh, uh, uh, is referring to uh, how uh, in the black art paper, uh, we actually deal with some of this. And, and uh, you know, we talk about how, you know, when you use a random effect, you actually end up with very different uh, adaptive parameters uh, than if you use a fixed effect. Uh, and so the reasons for that are rather complex. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, but the simple uh, story is that you don't wanna overload your models with too many predictors. Start with a small model first and build from there. At some point, it'll fall apart because it gets too complex. And so don't go that far. Uh, so all paradigms that we're gonna be looking at probably are gonna have learning. So that's another step in, in the model. Uh, learning is ubiquitous, uh, but it's, it's often different depending upon the paradigm. The curvature of the function is particularly important. Uh, uh, the, um, uh, the LKT pr provides many different options for the curvature of the learning function, uh, the log of the count of prior opportunities, the count, uh, whether uh, the, the difficulty at the time uh, those prior learning opportunities occurred in the difficulty-based count. Uh, you can take the count to a power, uh, which causes it to become uh, also curvilinear. And this is a good example of one where you could fit a nonlinear parameter to control the curvature of the learning function. Uh, and then there's also uh, the base two and the base four, uh, which are different ways of uh, using the, the log count with forgetting and spacing. Uh, and certainly there's not room to get into the details of forgetting and spacing models in, in this talk. Uh, but um, that's one of the things I've done a lot of my prior research on. Uh, and so there's a, a number of different ways to handle that. Uh, and, and there's, a, I think at least, I think there's at least one example of a spacing model in the examples we'll go by, go, go over later. Uh, later is actually sooner now. Uh, Nonlinear parameters uh, may, be, uh, may be interesting. Um, uh, I already mentioned the, the, the nonlinear parameter for, for practice uh, in, that, in that last slide, but there's also some that are uh, more related to forgetting. Uh, recency is, is talking about how, how recent things are remembered better. So it's, just, it's also a story about forgetting. Uh, forgetting usually is a, a more global term, uh, which is about aggregate recency effects. In other words, looking at all the prior practice and thinking about how all of it uh, 
uh, leads to the current performance and how time uh, and, and the loss of memory there somehow reduces that. The spacing effect is this uh, uh, temporal benefit between more rather than less spacing between repetitions and practice. Um, uh, and uh, it, it's easy to add features. Again, like I've said before, if your feature excites us, we can add it for you. Uh, there are some features that we already plan to add, and maybe, uh, maybe you'll suggest one uh, that we already hope to add, uh, and then that would boost it up on our list. Transfer learning uh, is another thing that you might try to do. Uh, and so transfer learning is a similar sort of issue as multi-skill learning, uh, because one way transfer can occur is if uh, things share skills. Um, and, and here, it's, uh, I talk about how multiple components can sum. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the data may list uh, the item in the KC columns, uh, and, and, and performance could be a function of, of these multiple columns. Um, and while the examples have uh, some, some illustrations of how this can be done, uh, I don't know the best way uh, it could be done, as I was uh, highlighting earlier uh, in response to the question. So you can also do interactions. Uh, I slipped in the uh, citation uh, to the R manual, which also talks about the, how our formulas are composed because we actually use the, the colon and the star operators, uh, which give the interaction and the interaction and main effects respectively. Uh, and so you can add another uh, section to the uh, uh, LKT code. Uh, which indicates how you want to combine things if you want to add one of these interactions. Interactions may, in fact, be part of the answer to how you use multi-skill models, because you may, in fact, um, be able to, um, I'm thinking at least, you might be able to control a multi-skill model if you have the interaction between the two skills also represented. Uh, but that's not published. Uh, in the past, learner models in logistic regression have uh, been almost purely additive which has been a theoretical limitation of lots of the work. Uh, and so uh, I hope that this will give people the opportunity to explore some new things here with these interactions. Uh, and so we can think about this then in terms of a, a bit of a richer example. Uh, we can think about you know, the, the KCs being the different pairs in multiplication learning. Uh, and, and so you know, two times two is four, two times three is six, four times five is 20 and so forth. Uh, this was in third grade for me here in the US. Uh, and so this would be you know, a, a primary school sort of tutoring system. In fact, I, I worked with uh, the, uh, the company K-12 to kind of build an algorithm like this uh, into one of their products um, uh, called uh, X-Germs, uh, where people would, uh, it was actually a gamified uh, where the, the model would end up selecting the uh, the, the, which uh, uh, problem the student would encounter next in the game. Uh, and so, so we can imagine then having the logic deck component, and, and uh, this one here traces the log of the prior successes and failures, successes divided by failures, uh, 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 and, and there's a decay parameter that uh, controls how, how, uh, how much those are weighted uh, toward recency, and we could use this to trace the student. Uh, we could also use the same one, uh, it's kind of a versatile one, to trace the, uh, the multiple choice KC, you know, which problem uh, it was, whether it was uh, two times three or, or four times five. Uh, and so if a student got more successes, then uh, it would kind of uh, uh, credit them with knowing it. Uh, and then, of course, maybe if we were using it in some sort of adaptive routine, we would drop it out of practice. Uh, so, uh, oh, actually, I see that it, my example was more complicated. Uh, and so multiple KC uh, assumes that I'm grouping them. Uh, and so I guess, I guess multiple KC then would assume that the, the, the two times ones were one group, the three times ones were one group, the four times ones. And so, so this is an example where we would be looking at the additive effect of, of uh, them learning the, the twos plus the effect of, for the third term here of whether they had learned the, the particular uh, uh, item from the twos column. Uh, and so uh, then we have the intercept for the item KC. That's the, the particular problem again. 
Uh, and so that would be the base difficulty of each pair. I can remember eight times seven was particularly hard for me for a while. Uh, I think seven times nine was another uh, difficult one. Um, uh, and, and so we don't have that difficulty for each of the columns uh, in this particular example model, but we could each also have that difficulty and say that maybe the seven times and the eight times are universally more difficult. Uh, but of course, we couldn't overload the model either, because if we have the difficulty for the items, that precludes the difficulty for the columns, because uh, those parameters would be redundant. Uh, and so you have to think about whether you know, you're representing a particular predictor twice, and you can actually do it uh, explicitly if you're not careful. Uh, and finally, the last predictor then is using this complicated prediction uh, called base four. Four stands for it having four nonlinear parameters. Uh, in order to track learning spacing and forgetting on top of the other previous effects. And so this is a rather uh, rich example, in other words, complicated. And, and when I start running the examples here in a minute, uh, I'm gonna be uh, starting with some simpler ones, definitely. Uh, so uh, Luke, um, I'm wondering uh, at this point, let's see. Do you wanna to try to go through these slides um, now or after a five minute break? Because I'm thinking I might switch over to R and get people started on the examples and then uh, take a five minute break and then have you come back and give these slides and then finish up some examples afterwards. Yeah, that sounds good. And also just, um, it's just in my head because of uh, people asking about how to use this. At some point, I think it'd be good if you went and just kind of briefly at a high level went over how a model like this could be used in practice to say like estimate mastery for a given skill to be used like in a running system, maybe for like category learning example, for example. Yeah, well, I have an adaptive uh, model that I've been working on as, as an example. Uh, maybe I'll make sure that we get to that. Um, right. Uh, it was actually at the end. So maybe it's good that you prompted me so that we will get to it. Sure. Uh, yeah, sounds good. Take a break then. Uh, well, no, no, not not a break yet. A break in five minutes. I want to just show uh, the examples uh, and how we get them started here uh, to people first. Uh, okay. And so uh, here, can people see our studio on your screen now? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and let me make the type a little bigger here. Uh, and so you see, I've I've loaded in the LKT library, uh, and if you want to. Uh, use the code I'm, I'm actually going to be running, uh, you need to go to this link that I'm going to be putting in the chat here. Uh, and so it's from the GitHub. Unfortunately, the example link has a couple things missing uh, uh, if, you, if you just look at the HTML. But if you go to this particular link, you'll find the full original version that I ran. Uh, and so I'm going to just start running that a little bit and get us through uh, a couple little parts. Oh, hey, yeah. Phil, uh, interesting question here about uh, comparing a model built with LKT to something like half life regression yeah. from the, the, like the Duolingo model. Yeah, uh, in, in, uh, in fact, I, I think that the half life regression might be already kind of on the short list to something I'd want to build into LKT. Uh, in my understanding, it is logistic regression, right? Yeah, it is. I think, like, basically, yeah. when it's talked about, like, it's, it's uh, a logistic regression model that accounts for spacing um, that tracks, that uh, is also combined with, like, a decision rule for when something gets practiced. Yeah, and so the decision rule, then, uh, is something that LKT doesn't control. Uh, but, uh, in fact, we, we, I have my own methods for designing decision rules. Uh, but the the regression part of it should be uh, addable, right? Yeah, we were going to include it initially in the LPT paper, but the reason we didn't is because the data set provided by Duolingo didn't track things at the individual item level. It tracks them at like sets of items. But we were going to we were going to fit it. Um, yeah, we just... so, so so thanks for prompting us. I think we'll try to get to that then. So you saw how I ran the first thing I did was I ran these packages. Uh, and uh, make sure those are loaded up. Uh, and so uh, then the next thing is I just go down to this next chunk of code here. 
Uh, and I'm going to copy that here from that uh, uh, GitHub page that I just put in chat. Uh, and I'm going to post it in here to run. Uh, you can see most of it runs fairly quickly, except this compute spacing predictor. Some of the more complicated models require us to compute some temporal predictors. Uh, if you should try this on your own data set and it doesn't run, it probably just means the column headers are a little bit off. Uh, and we haven't made it 100% flexible. For instance, you still need the anonymous student ID column. Uh, and I believe you still need um, uh, the duration column. Uh, and you may need this time column. Uh, and so I, I certainly am very happy to help people with uh, errors they're getting uh, if, if uh, you know, it, it doesn't run on your data set. Uh, but of course, you could also maybe, uh, you know, if you want, you could just check the code too. But uh, ultimately, I, I don't want to have to have anybody checking the code. Uh, it does simplify things, of course, because you don't need to tell it where your student uh, uh, column is. It's going to assume your student column is always here. Uh, the anonymous student ID. Uh, okay, so it's 11.01. Uh, this is going to run. It'll be done by the time I'm back. Uh, I just need to take a little rest here. Uh, my COVID is making me a little bit tired. Uh, and um, Luke, uh, I don't know, um, uh, 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 you can answer questions if you want, but uh, also feel free to take a break, uh, other people, uh, if you want. Um, yeah, I'll probably get a drink of water, but um, just to follow up on the half-life regression, um, I believe you could represent, I think you could build the half-life regression model within LKT if you fixed um, decay parameters to whatever value they use in there. Um, because they're, what well, a major part of it is that they're um, assuming that memory decays exponentially over time at a certain rate. Um, which you could do in LKT with certain functions, um, like base, I believe, um, is, the, is the name of the function. And you could have that be, you know, at the count, at the count of practice or count of success or count of failures. Um, and base two is similar, but um, assume that decay happens differently between sessions versus within sessions. And so I think you could make um, something quite close to the half-life regression model in here and compare it to other things. Totally, yeah. Um, and if you think of like questions later after this, feel free to email me or Phil. Um, we'd love to talk about this stuff. Anyway, I'm gonna get a drink of water. I'll be back in a few minutes.
Okay, it seems like my screen is still shared. Uh, <laughs> so you can see that the code uh, from the uh, uh, examples here uh, has ran. Uh, let's go back to where I cut and paste that from here. Uh, and so I, I remember I put this link in the chat just a minute ago. Uh, if you want to follow along, the data here you can see larger raw samp large raw sample is already in the package, so there's nothing to download. My note about downloading the data is uh, uh, <coughs> old and should have been removed in version 1.2. Um, so now we have the data and it's all correctly loaded up. We could run the additive factors model here. Let me just copy that. I'll pop it in here. And it runs and we have a very high R squared. Of course, that's partially because probably overfitting. We're not cross validating here. And also because with all of those intercepts for the student proficiency and the uh, difficulty of those knowledge components, uh, we get a lot of uh, fit just from that. Um, we can look at this model then uh, in a lot of different ways. Uh, we can look at the model ob, uh, and that has a bunch of different things in it, right? too many different things to really think about. So we can look at the structure of the model ob uh, to get a better idea. Oh, its structure is pretty uh, difficult. Um, because it has more details than I wanted to show. Uh, let's just look at it like this. I type dollar sign, I get the list of what I can get from it, which is usually how I use it. Uh, and so one thing we often want to get are the coefficients. Uh, and so you can see here, uh, here are the intercepts for the students. Uh, there's a really nice uh, built-in function here that I've added, view Excel. Uh, and so I can type monolog coefficients. And this is actually built in the package. You might actually really like it for other uses. Um, but when I run it, it's just going to pop it up in Excel here. I'll pull it over to my screen. It's uh, on my other screen and I'm just transferring it. And what it does, the, uh, the view Excel is it just pops up whatever thing you just ran in uh, Excel. Uh, and so here we can see uh, this is the line AFM parameter. Uh, and here, oh yes, uh, the recording will be uh, on my YouTube page uh, and uh, we'll make sure to send that to the, uh, the email list. Uh, and so, so you can see the, the line AFM here, uh, let me make it a little bigger, uh, is the first parameter, a little, little smaller. Uh, and it's 0.55, which indicates fairly strong uh, uh, learning rate. Uh, and then uh, we, have, we have the individual intercepts for each of the knowledge components. And so the, 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 this data set then is fill in the blank sentences. Uh, and you can see that some of them go from very difficult uh, to quite a bit easier. Uh, and then down below, uh, if we scroll down, we can also see the uh, proficiency of the students. And likewise, the, the students here, uh, which were Amazon Turkers, uh, uh, were, um... oh, really? Oh, okay. Uh, thank you for the, uh, can you copy uh, Lakshmi's uh, issue there, Luke, so that we can um, uh, take care of that? Yeah. Thanks. Um, and, uh, and so, so that's how we can uh, look at the uh, coefficients. Of course, we could always just, uh, you know, if we don't, if we have that problem that uh, Lakshmi is mentioning, uh, we could um, just view in the regular our studio interface right here. I'll close that up though. Uh, and let's look at another example. So we saw the additive factors model there, except you might've noticed if you're really experienced in this, I actually had a, a, a reduced version of the additive factors model uh, because the original additive factors model uh, has a, a dollar sign here because what it, it's fitting uh, is actually looking at a different uh, a learning rate for each of the student or for each of the knowledge components. And so, uh, when you remove the dollar sign, it's only one. And as we saw, it was 0.55. But here, if we add the dollar sign and then run it, uh, it's going to actually add it, uh, the, the ones for each individual. And so when we go to view uh, and look at that again, 
uh, we can see uh, after the intercepts here, let's scroll down so we can see them. Here we have the uh, down at the bottom, a little hard to see in this one. Ah, oh, there it is. Uh, we can see that each one of the particular knowledge components has a different difficulty level. Some of them are much harder, uh, or, or, no, I'm sorry, learning rate. Uh, some of them are much, uh, 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 oh, this is interesting. Some of them are negative. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm looking at the intercepts, my bad. Yeah, we shouldn't see negative, that's why I was confused. Here we're looking at the learning rates. I was looking at the wrong section of the coefficients is all. Uh, and you can see that they're positive, but they're not all 0.55. In other words, uh, you know, we're finding some differences in how fast things are learned. A question might be is whether these differences show on cross-validation. Uh, because one thing you might notice is, uh, uh, for those people who are paying extra special uh, attention, is that when I added this dollar sign, the fit didn't actually get that much better. Here we have a 289 fit, uh, whereas uh, you know, when we just ran this original version, uh, we had a 28 fit. So uh, it, it, it doesn't actually add all that much. Uh, so, uh, you know, you have many different uh, uh, things going on here uh, in the examples. Uh, let's just run the PFA one for a second. Uh, so here we, we see that the fit increased a little bit. Uh, it was 289 uh, on this version up here with the AFM with the dollar sign. And now we have a 295 uh, when we use the dollar sign with the successes and failures like this model is doing. Uh, and again, we could always go in and look at the, uh, the coefficients uh, if we needed to for uh, you know, explaining them in our paper. Uh, and, and, uh, and so what we'll see here, here are the success coefficients. We will find that success values are gonna be quite a bit higher uh, then the failure values, let's see if I can find the failure values. The failure values are here. The failure values are lower. However, because this is memory data, uh, the failure values don't go negative. Uh, uh, and, and the thing is, is that because they're only memorizing things, you can learn from a failure and move up fairly quickly. And so you, you do see that only a few of them are probably gonna be negative here uh, for the, uh, for the failure. Yeah, here's a is, failure. Is what this is that they're given feedback, right? Yeah, and that's because they get such strong feedback in this data set. We don't see the failure PFA parameters become negative. Also though, it probably has to do with the fact that we're adding intercepts uh, for the knowledge components, because when you have the initial difficulty set correctly, then you're gonna get a better uh, model of the, uh, uh, the failure, the effect of failures and successes. If you set all of the items at the same initial difficulty, uh, then sometimes the failure parameters, uh, the failure learning parameter will just track the difficulty. Uh, and so you, uh, this is this issue of multicollinearity that always happens in regressions. I think there's, might be another question in the chat. Uh, for student intercepts in this case, student intercepts in, are fit, uh, um, it, it, it's, uh, it's not quite either of what you're saying. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's kind of like the, the, the global mean of their performance. Uh, and, and so the, you need to think of the model kind of as an ensemble. Uh, and so the intercept typically represents the initial performance uh, for students. Uh, uh, for a knowledge component uh, or for, for, their, for the student overall, if it's a student intercept. Uh, uh, because the, the, these other LK teams, LKT terms tend to add on learning on top of the intercept. Uh, and so because the learning comes after, uh, the, the intercept ends up representing the initial performance. Uh, and we'll see, um, we'll see student learning rates uh, in more complicated models here. In fact, why don't we get to one uh, because I am quickly running out of time. Uh, this PFA difficulty sensitive predictors is pretty complicated. Uh, it, it might be really interesting 
uh, if you're if you're interested in adaptive learning, and, and there's uh, some papers written about it uh, recently, um, uh, and uh, and that's where you look at the, uh, the probability correct of the prior uh, performances, and and you credit them better if they're more near the middle of the distribution, if they're more near 50 percent or 70 percent, or something like that. Whereas if they're uh, if you think that people never had a chance of getting them right or had a 100% chance of getting them right, uh, then uh, you propose that they are gonna have less learning. Uh, and so that's what this uh, diff core comp uh, uh, is doing. A recency per performance factors analysis is, is a, a way of, of using this prop deck uh, feature. Uh, this is described in, in uh, the, uh, papers by uh, Gelyart and Golden on this method. Uh, let's let's go forward uh, to uh, the I believe I have one that is the IAFM model, which includes the student learning rate. And so let's let's just show this one for a second. And so the way we coded the student learning rate in this example is to use the covariate and to have the line AFM, in other words, the effect of uh, 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 the prior opportunities uh, for the KC, you can see KC default for this line AFM, interact with the identity of the student. Uh, and so, uh, so that then is gonna give us this additional parameter and then we can look at our coefficients as we always done. Uh, as we always do, and see how that varies then. I believe those are uh, here at the bottom. Uh, no, those are, those are the ones for the individual uh, uh, values. Uh, just looking for the interaction term. So here are interactions, line AFM with the student. Uh, and you can see that, for instance, this student here, uh, actually uh, has a very fast learning rate, uh, whereas this student here has a learning rate about a third as large. And so that's one nice example, because of course the IAFM is, is published by other people. Uh, this also shows an example of how LKT is replicating one of these variants. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, that reminds me, thank you, Luke, uh, to let you have a few minutes here at the end, definitely. Uh, Cross-validation is another option. Uh, 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 so in the initial uh, preparation of the data, uh, you might see that there's actual code that's creating uh, data folds. Uh, and that allows us to run uh, this cross-validation connect uh, 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 right here. Uh, and, and so uh, you can see, I'll, I'll just run it. So let's see a quick demonstration of that because typically we're interested in cross-validation uh, because it's gonna be required in our publications. Uh, and so you can see here uh, that um, uh, when I add the uh, dollar sign uh, uh, and uh, the, actually I have a mistake in my code because you don't use the dollar sign for the intercept, but it just ignores it. Uh, uh, and, and so you can see that even though I'm adding this, this new slope, the dollar sign for the line AFM is adding a new slope for each of the KCs, uh, it, it only does a little bit better uh, for cross-validation. And so here are the cross-validation numbers. And so you can see adding this dollar sign here does just a little bit better for our R-squared fit. Whereas if we look at the fit here, uh, it adds considerably more. Uh, and so here it adds about, you know, uh, 0 0.009, and here it adds only about 0 0.005. Uh, and so we can see that when we add this dollar sign, there's a certain amount of overfitting that's occurring. Uh, uh, and, and that amount of overfitting is, is a little bit worse than when we just use a simpler model. Uh, uh, one last demonstration on my end uh, uh, before uh, I turn it over to Luke for a little bit from him. So uh, I wanna just go down to my other open R thing here, uh, my other window 
and grab one of my latest examples. Oh, I see I don't have that up, uh, that's how I thought. And so this is an example of a highly adaptive model. And it also shows an example of an illustration of how you could plot the results as well. Uh, it's not that much more complicated. Uh, it's gonna be out in version 1.3. Oh, what did I do wrong? Oh, it worked. So these are the two plots. Uh, you can ignore the error. I was trying to compute this value of these three asterisks here. Um, uh, and so uh, and this is a very simple model because it only has just a few predictors. Uh, it's got logit dec, uh, which predicts the student. It's got the, uh, uh, the gain for successes for each KC, uh, and then it's got the recency for each KC. And so this recency effect is gonna track uh, uh, failures as well, because the recency applies to both successes and failures. Uh, and, and just, uh, Amy, the reason why the dollar sign was causing the overfitting is because it adds an additional parameter for each knowledge component. Uh, and so you're adding a lot of parameters when you add the dollar sign because it adds an additional coefficient for each knowledge component. Uh, and, and so anyhow, this one doesn't use a dollar sign. So sorry, I, I, I stopped for the question, but it was a, an important question. Uh, and so after I ran this model, then I plotted it uh, just to see how it looked. X1 is actually, if we look here, X1 is plotting the answers and X2 is actually plotting the model. Uh, and you see by flipping back and forth, they're quite close, uh, especially since if we look at the model, uh, model of dollar sign coefs, this is actually only a four parameter model. Uh, and uh, this, uh, this over, uh, by not using the dollar sign and only having four parameters, it avoids overfitting. Uh, but, uh, you, you might be impressed that a four parameter model actually does so good uh, at capturing the learning curve. I was pretty happy to see that. Uh, and so Luke, uh, uh, let me stop sharing. I'm gonna just give you, um, uh, uh, make, you make you the co-host right now so you can just take control. Your co-host, you're muted. Uh, a question just came up about assumptions about the model. Um, you want to handle it? Uh, yeah, yeah. So basically, it's, are there prerequisite assumptions to be made about the data, such as normality, mean sample size, et cetera? So they're similar to uh, well, it's logistic regression at, at the end of the day, right? And so minimum sample size is an issue when you have lots of items, like, or cases. And so certain rules of thumb or some people use is you need, you know, minimum. 20 observations per item, um, but it's best to just cross validate anyway. Um, and that's why it's good to be pretty careful about adding additional you know, parameters per KC because um, sometimes there can be way more items or items that are only viewed by, you know, or there might only be a couple observations for certain items, which can be a major issue in these like educational data sets that we get where there's loads of data, but maybe, you know, not very many observations for certain items. Anything to add to that, Phil? No, I, I wanna give you a chance to introduce the confidence intervals at the very least. So I probably wanna switch yeah. over to that. I'll, I'll try to handle questions in chat for us. Sure. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll skip ahead. You, you've talked a lot about this. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. yes. All right, I'm just, I think we talked a lot about these things. I'll talk about this first. Um, so, uh, slideshow. Cool. So, um, the back end where we fit the models uh, uses libLinear, which is very fast, which is good. And that's why we chose it. But it the fitting procedure, um, 
the reason it's fast is also the reason that you don't get confidence intervals um, because it doesn't have like the same kind of distributional assumptions that traditional um, like GLM would. And so that means that, you know, when Phil's showing you those, um, those like coefficients, we don't know which ones are like significant in the traditional sense. Um, you kind of have to know a lot about the feature you're looking at and kind of have like a gut sense, um, but, uh, and or cross validate and see which ones drop out. But another thing we can do is do bootstrap sampling to get intervals. And so the LKT HDI function allows that. And so <clears throat> that's a highest density interval. And um, this will allow you to have some kind of estimate of what's significant and what isn't when you're viewing the parameters, uh, the coefficients. So the process is basically the same. So this is the screenshot is of actually like the code to run it. Um, it takes in the typical inputs the components and the features, and also information about the number of students to use per repetition and the credibility mass. That's kind of like the confidence interval in a sense. Um, and what it'll do is repeatedly fit the random subsamples of the data. Because we're fitting so fast, in about a minute, you could you know do this a hundred times and uh, it'll return um, whether the credibility mass crosses zero for a feature as well as what the coefficients were on each run and the upper and lower bounds. <clears throat> and so that allows you to do interesting things. Like on the left here, this is just a plot of the coefficients that we got on 100 runs for one of the coefficients. This one seems to be you know, reliably uh, positive, but you can see there's significant spread here in the values. And depending on your use case, that might matter, depending on what this feature is. And that's something that can be <coughs> no um, without this kind of bootstrapping procedure. Um, below is just a screenshot of actually doing this with the output from LKT HDI. So it's pretty straightforward, right? So it's just going and getting the, um, the parameter values for this particular coefficient, and then just plotting bars for the upper and lower bounds. And then on the right here is another output, which is a data frame that holds um, the upper and lower bounds of the um, credibility mass for the repeated sampled coefficients for each of these um, features, and also whether or not it included zero. If it does, that's a, potentially a problem, right? It's probably not significant. And so you can sort by that column and you can see things that aren't significant. And in this case, um, the line fail coefficients for some of these KCs wasn't significant. And so that might mean that the benefit of including line fail might be mostly for uh, a subset of the KCs, which depending on your question could be pretty interesting, right? So go this, they're benefiting from failures for some of these things, but not for others. And uh, that wasn't the case in this example with um, the counts of uh, successes. And so that's uh, basically what the point of this additional function is, is uh, allowing you to get time to take that deeper dive into what's significant and what isn't to help like more exploration of your, uh, you know, your adaptive system, if that's what you're uh, working on. <clears throat> Any uh, questions about that? Looks like some stuff came up. Uh, no, that's all Phil, I think. Cool. Um, Phil, one thing I wanted to talk about in like the last minute is uh, just like possible like use cases for this or how it's being used in production um, with like, like the category learning um, example or something like that. Because one question I've gotten is how do you use this to like estimate mastery, for example? Well, uh, so, I mean, that, that's a good question. Uh, you know, if we look at, um, if we look at the, uh, uh, the example I gave last, uh, let me share my screen again, I guess. Sure. Uh, I was also just running your, the example from the uh, confidence intervals uh, here too. 
But if we look at this example of this four parameter model that I was showing along with the plots, uh, you can see that uh, there's the, you know, the X is the actual data and the X2 is our model of the data. Uh, however, we've, we've structured this model uh, so that it only uses predictive information. In other words, it only uses prior information for each student uh, to make the predictions. And so when a, in, a, in a running system, then you could use a model like this to compute at any point in time what, what the student is at for all of the knowledge components, because you can input the history into the model and get this on the fly running estimate of where they're at. Uh, then the question becomes is how do you determine what to do with that? Uh, and so what we've done a, a variety of work trying to infer that from the model, you know, in other words, what to do with it. And one of the things that inferring it from the model leads to is sort of a conclusion that uh, we want to use a, a, a particular percent correct. In other words, we want to select a difficulty value, say 70%, 80%. I, I recently saw a paper that generally had in the title that 85% was the value we should be using. Um, uh, Luke, uh, that's pretty close to what you saw in your research too, isn't it? Yeah, although um, I think it necessarily has to vary according to the context of what's being studied and like how much feedback you can give and how long it takes, things like that. Right, and that's but, where uh, this is a fly in the ointment and that's where my research program is another 20 years of work to it. Uh, is because you know uh, the methods for inferring what the optimal value is are, are still rather unknown. We could do it experimentally. Uh, we could yeah. we, you know, gather a bunch of students in a context and see what probability works best for them, and then use that. And if you have enough data, that might be a great way to do it. Uh, but uh, uh, or simulation, we've yeah, done that. Well, well simulation is, is more difficult because you know if your simulation of the context isn't good, well then the, the simulation isn't going to result in strong predictions. But, um, um, but yeah, so just to recap with the like estimating mastery, because I, I feel like that's a, a lot of people's possible use case is basically once you have a model trained to estimate mastery at a given moment for a given skill, you would input to the trained model, like basically the input features that the model would need to run. And it should output a probability estimate for like, let's say a particular skill. And yeah. that that probability is the master estimate. And so I see some people are dropping off and I probably should, we should yeah. probably not go too much longer. Uh, yeah, I think so. Imagine other people are planning their lunches or whatnot. Uh, but um, just to say one thing is uh, to add to this, this final point is that this is one of the reasons why we don't use intercepts and why this example I'm showing you here uh, uh, only uses one intercept to indicate just the, the basic difficulty of the context is because uh, you, know, you, you don't know the student intercepts and the knowledge component intercepts ahead of time. And so uh, it can be difficult to make an adaptive model if you don't know the students or the items ahead of time. Uh, and so if I knew the students and, item, and items ahead of time, I could use more exact intercepts. Like uh, for instance, I could use the difficulty of the items if I had had data uh, uh, to, to calculate that. Uh, but we always want, want to, um, kind of keep track of the fact of, of when we build models for adaptive situations and actual systems, we're only gonna have certain information available. And so we have to only build the model with that certain information available. Oh, and a couple of great questions came up. So uh, first one, when we talk of mastery, does it imply long-term learning as well? So in this case with the example I used, it's just the output from the model. So be at that given moment, how likely it thought a student was to be correct for a given skill, but um, whether or not that probability changes over time at all depends on if the features of the model account for time or order effects. So if it's just counts of practice, if prediction will be the same today as in a month from now, right, which would be probably not accurate because learning is going to decay over time. So it's usually used as like instantaneous, like this is where they're at right now. And the other yeah, question. And so, so, so to add one thing to that is that you could, though, compute it at a future time too and have yeah. some sort of criterion there. Uh, and so, this is another of the complexities is, is whether you want to have a short term criterion or a long term criterion. Yeah. Like if your model was counts of practice as well as time since last practice, the recency feature, then you could put in it like a, you could have your like input like row 
that you wanted to give a probability for row of data um, include like elapsed time and have that change to be some large number. And that would be estimating like what they'll know in the future, how much they'll forget. The problem um, with answering the question actually is that a lot of the prior literature has been somewhat confused because the mastery criterion is really a criterion for completion, not a criterion for when to practice. And so there's really two criterions hiding under the hood there. Uh, uh, and you have to decide which one or both you're going to use in a running system. So, okay, uh, 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 happy to hang out a little more, but let's call this the final conclusion and uh, stop the camera. Uh, and uh, I'll see you all later. Feel free to email too. Thanks, everybody. One last question there was that. Okay, I'll, I'll keep the uh, recording on because it looks like it might be a good question. Wouldn't LKT give mastery in terms of an item rather than a KC, generally speaking, unless there's only one KC involved in the item? But what if we were interested in mastery on each KC from evidence of items involving multiple KCs? So, I mean, the question is kind of interesting. Um, uh, well, uh, what if you're interested in mastery of each KC? Well, then you could, I mean, you could read that off from the model, but uh, I right. think uh, uh, by looking at what the model was predicting for each one of those KCs, uh, is that kind of the answer to your question? I guess if you're tracking items and items within KCs at the same time, you could make item level predictions as well as KC level ones? Yeah, in fact, you could. So, Go ahead. Oh, maybe I would just talk directly. So um, if I want to get KC level probability, um, then do you mean that I just turn off all the other uh, well, uh, Now that I'm features? thinking about it, yeah, that's a kind of a complicated question because it, unless you've observed the KC in the context of uh, an actual uh, uh, individual item, you're, you're only going to be able to, to get, you're not going to be able to get a probability for the KC because it's never been identified by itself. Right. Unless you fit and ignore item level stuff like they do with some other systems. But, but that, oh. that's going to that's be really tricky to do because you know, the, for like the, the baseline difficulty and so forth. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that you can easily get that. You could, you could compare the different KCs in terms of how much logistic gain or what, what, what hmm. each one was at. Uh, well, but the to actually get a valid probability for the KC, I think you'd need to observe that KC uh, in items that only had that KC. Oh yeah, so yeah, if it had multiple KCs associated with that one, yeah, yeah. So if there's multiple KCs associated with all items, then a probability estimate for only one of the KCs, is that what we're talking about now? Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, because if there's only one column for KCs and only one KC associated with any observation, like 